Welcome to the series of the prophecies of Daniel and Revelation. We are into topic number 22 of 24. Just three more to go. And I'm sure you're being blessed by the study of God's Word. Our topic tonight is, Does God Inspire Astrologists and Psychics? Let's begin with a story found in 1 Kings chapter 22. Ahab, the wicked king of Israel, wanted to recapture the town of Ramath Gilead from the Syrians, but he needed help. So he asked good king Jehoshaphat of Judah to join his campaign against their common enemy. Jehoshaphat said he was willing to join forces with Ahab, but that they should first seek God's counsel. Ahab had forsaken the Lord years earlier to worship the pagan god Baal. So he called the 400 hired prophets of Baal to come before the two monarchs. With dramatic display, these false prophets said, Go and fight the Syrians, and you will be victorious. But King Jehoshaphat requested to hear from a true prophet of the Lord. Ahab said that there was one prophet of Jehovah left, whose name was Micaiah. But he added, I hate him, for he doth not prophesy good concerning me, but evil. Verse 8. At Joph Jehoshaphat's insistence, Ahab reluctantly sent a servant to fetch Micaiah. The brave prophet came and made a very unpopular prediction. He told Ahab that he would die in the battle with Syria. Now Ahab faced with a tough decision. Should he believe the 400 prophets who say nice things or one lone prophet of the Lord. The Bible says, and Micaiah said, If thou return at all in peace, the Lord hath not spoken by me. 1 Kings 22, 28. Stubborn King Ahaz persuaded Jehoshaphat to disregard the warning of prophet Micaiah and join him in the war. He thought he would outsmart the Lord by dressing in full armor and avoiding the front lines of battle. But I have learned too late that you can never escape the word of God. During the battle, a stray arrow flying through the air struck Ahab in the joints of his armor, and he bled to death in his chariot. The Bible says, and a certain man drew a bow at venture and smote the king of Israel. 1 Kings 22, 34. The words of a true prophet of God never fails. Just like the prophets of Baal, then who prophesied lies, Jesus warned there will be many false prophets in the last days. That is why we must know how to distinguish the true from the counterfeit. It may be a matter of life and death. The Apostle Paul in Acts 17 tells of the church members in the city of Berea and how after they heard the message, they went home and studied the scriptures to see if it were all true, to study for themselves, beloved. We desire the same of you. Each evening during this prophecy series, we will make available a free offer that goes along with the topic of the evening. I hope you will request your free copy so that you too may come to know the truth that can be found only in the Bible. To get tonight's offer, just visit the website or call us on the number listed on the screen and we will send it to you. And after you read it, make sure to share it with a friend.
Let's go to our first question. To whom does the Lord reveal his final plans? The Bible says, Surely the Lord will do nothing, but he revealeth a secret unto his servants, the prophets. Amos 3, 7. Before the entrance of sin, Adam and Eve held open communion with their maker. But since man separated himself from God by transgression, the human race has been cut off from this high privilege. But by the plan of redemption, however, a way has been opened whereby the inhabitants of the earth may still have connection with heaven. God has communicated with men by his spirit and divine light has been imparted to the world by revelations to his chosen servants. The scripture says, holy men of God speak as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. 2 Peter 1.21 God reveals his plans to us because God does not want us to be taken by surprise by the events that would unfold in this world. Remember, to be forewarned is to be forearmed. And it is through these chosen vessels of his, the prophets, God unfolds the future to his children. Let's go to our second question. Will there be both true and false prophets in the last days? Jesus said, And many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. Matthew 24 and verse 11. So there are going to come and are already come many false prophets. Their work is a work of deception. Now, what is deception? Deception is mixing truth with lies, right with wrong. It is always more of good and less of bad. For example, if one offered you a glass of deadly poison, would you drink it? Unless someone wants to die, they would. But if someone offered a glass of grape juice, with a few drops of deadly poison, you know, people would drink it thinking it is grape juice because it will look like grape juice. It will smell like grape juice. It will taste like grape juice. Finally, a person will die who drinks it, not because of the full glass of grape juice, but because of the few drops of the deadly poison. These false prophets will use the name of Jesus and do many wonderful things to disguise their true identity. They are wolves in sheep's clothing, as Jesus said. Jeremiah 14, 14 records, Then the Lord said unto me, The prophets prophesy lies in my name. I sent them not, neither have I commanded them, neither speak unto them. They prophesy unto you a false vision and divination and a thing of naught and the deceit of their heart. Yes, it is all done in the name of Jesus to deceive their followers. Will there be true prophets as well? Let's see what the Bible says. Peter wrote, And it shall come to pass, In the last days saith God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Acts 2 and verse 17. So the gift of prophecy did not end with the Bible prophets. God has promised to send them to guide and to admonish his church. If God would never send a true prophet at all, then the scripture would have told us that very plainly. And anyone who claims to be a prophet, we could right away dismiss them and reject them. No, true prophets will come according to scripture. Therefore, Satan sends his false prophets in order to deceive people so that 
they would accept them and be lost by their misguided teachings. Let me tell you something very important. To accept a false prophet is a dangerous thing because it is like accepting the devil himself, for they are his representatives. On the other hand, to reject a true prophet is again dangerous because it is like rejecting God, for they are the ambassadors of God to bless us. So we can't take a neutral stand on the topic of prophets. We must make a choice to either accept or reject them based on testing them with the Bible. Also in the Bible, you see, God used not just men, but women as well. They were given the spirit of prophecy to communicate His truth to the people. Moses wrote, Then Miriam the prophetess, the sister of Aaron, took the timbrel in her hand, and all the women went out after her with timbrels and with dances. Exodus 15, verse 20. What about in the New Testament? Do we have women prophetess there as well? The Bible says, And there was one Anna, a prophetess, the daughter of Penuel, of the tribe of Asher. She was of a great age. Luke 2, 36. And in the book of Acts, we read, On the next day, we who were Paul's companions departed and came to Caesarea and entered the house of Philip the evangelist. And then the text continues, who was one of the seven and stayed with him. Now this man had four virgin daughters who prophesied. Acts 21 verse 9. Yes, there will be both true and false prophets in the end time. The scripture also teaches that prophets can be either men or women. Let's go to our question number three. What types of false prophets are specially condemned in the Bible? A, one that useth divination. That's a fortune teller, Deuteronomy 18.10. Two forms of divination developed in ancient Northeast, one using inductive manipulation of the natural or human phenomena, and the other taking intuitive forms of inner revelation. These were practiced by people and God strictly forbade them. B, an observer of times, that's an astrologer, Deuteronomy 18.10. These were the ones who profess to divine future events by the appearance of the stars in the sky, studying their paths and patterns and determining the path and destiny of people by them. C, an enchanter, that's a magician, Deuteronomy 18 verse 10. The magician basically attempts to exploit supernatural powers by formalic recitations to achieve goals that were otherwise unrealizable. D, a witch, that's a female psychic, Deuteronomy 18 and verse 10. Someone who practices magic or sorceries. E, a charmer, a person who casts spells or charms, Deuteronomy 18, 11. He is a person who practices serpent charming. It was an early and universal opinion that the most venomous reptiles could be made harmless by certain charms or sweet sounds. A consulter with familiar spirits. That's a spirit medium, Deuteronomy 18 and verse 11. These are sorcerers or necromancers who profess to call up the dead people to answer questions 
about the living. G, a wizard, that's a male psychic, Deuteronomy 18 and verse 11. A pretender to supernatural knowledge and power, a knowing one, as the original Hebrew suggests. H, a necromancer, that's a person who claims to consult with the dead, Deuteronomy 18 and verse 11. Now, Deuteronomy 18, 9 to 12 says that all who do these things are an abomination to the Lord. For this reason, Christians should not have anything to do with these mediums. Let's proceed to question number four. Will God's end time church have the gift of prophecy? The scripture says, and the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed. Revelation 12 and verse 17. And it continues, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Revelation 12 verse 17. What is the testimony of Jesus Christ? The Bible gives the answer elsewhere. The angel told John, I am thy fellow servant and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Revelation 19 and verse 10. So the testimony of Jesus, according to the angel, is the spirit of prophecy. That is the prophetic gift given by the Holy Spirit to his church. Also, when you compare this verse of Revelation 19:10 to Revelation 22, 8 and 9, you can clearly see that it is the prophets who have the testimony of Jesus, which means God's last day church, the remnant, will have a prophet among them, just like the first century church had the prophetic gift. Also, when we read the book of Amos, the Bible says, surely the Lord God does nothing unless he reveals his secret to his servants, the prophets. Amos chapter three and verse seven. And in the book of Malachi, we read, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Malachi 4 and verse 5. So according to this passage of Malachi, God has promised to send the prophetic gift to his church before Jesus comes, the gift that Elijah had. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 5 to 8, Paul writes that the church will have the testimony of Jesus Christ and will come behind no gift until the second coming. So, God's last day church will indeed still have the gift of prophecy. Let's go to our next question. In what ways does God speak to a true prophet? God himself said, If there be a prophet among you, I, the Lord, will make myself known unto him in a vision and will speak unto him in a dream. Him will I speak with mouth to mouth. Numbers 12, verses 6 and 8. Prophet Zechariah wrote, And the angel that talked with me came again and waked me as a man that is wakened out of his sleep. Zechariah 4 and verse 1. The Lord speaks to his prophets by visions, by dreams, face to face, through angels. Now a dream we all know is, a pers is when a person is sleeping. But a vision is when a person is awake. He sees things which the Lord reveals to him or her. God spoke to Joseph in a dream. God spoke to Isaiah in a vision. And God spoke to Abraham and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and many others through the visitations of angels. 
whereas crystal balls, palm readings, tea leaf uh, deciphering, stargazing, and uh, claiming to talk with the dead are not God's method of communicating with a prophet. These are counterfeits which Satan uses to communicate with his prophets. We saw in our study number 17, the bride of Jesus, where God told us which would be his remnant church, his last day church before Jesus comes. And one of the characteristics of that church is that it would have the spirit of prophecy or a prophet among them. Indeed, the same year when Jesus began his judgment in the heavenly sanctuary in 1844 AD. Now we saw that calculation in our topic number 16 right on time. That same year in 1844, God gave the prophetic gift to Ellen White, a young girl of 17 years of age. Ellen White had 2,000 visions and dreams of over a period of 70 years. When she was 17 years old, God chose her to be a special instrument during the Millerite movement in the United States of America. In fact, before God called Ellen, two other people were given visions from the Lord in the 1840s. One was William Foy, early in 1842. Foy had experienced two visions. The third and the last vision Foy experienced was in 1844. Foy was experiencing financial pressures and there were other things about the vision that he could not understand. Therefore, he stopped recounting them. Hazen Foss was the next one to receive the visions. He had his first vision shortly before October 22, 1844. That's the judgment day. That was the day when the Millerites expected Jesus to come back. Shortly after the great disappointment, he was bidden to relate the vision to others, but he was disinclined to do so. He was warned of God as to the consequences of failing to relate to others what had been revealed to him and what was told if he refused the light, it would be given to someone else. Horrified of his own stubbornness, he told the Lord that he would relate the vision. But when he attempted to do so, before a company of believers, he could not call it to mind. Two months later, when Ellen Armon, as she had been called before her marriage, received a first vision, friends fully expected her to be dead before springtime because she was very weak and sick. Foss was once in the house of his sister in which some believers met to hear this young girl. By the time Foss had already rejected his visions. When Ellen received her first vision, upon meeting her the next morning, he recounted his experience of which she had. He had not known her before this. He encouraged her to be faithful in performing her work. He said, and I quote, I believe the visions are taken from me and given to you. Do not refuse to obey God, for it will be at the peril of your soul. I am a lost man. You are a chosen vessel of God. Be faithful in doing the work of God, and the crown that I might have had, you will receive." Unquote. Ellen G. White, Letter 37, 1890. Let's see what happened when Ellen White went in vision. Number one, immediately preceding a vision, both Mrs. White and others in the room experienced a deep sense of the presence of God. Two, 
As the vision began, Ellen White would exclaim, Glory! or glory to God, at times repeated. Three, she experienced a loss of physical strength. Four, subsequently, she often manifested supernatural strength. Five, she did not breathe, but her heartbeat continued normally, and the color in her cheeks was natural. Six, occasionally, she gave exclamations indicative of the scenes being presented to her. Seven, her eyes were open, not with the vacant stare, but as if she were intently watching something. Eight, her position might vary. At times, she was seated, at times reclining. At times, she walked about the room and made graceful gestures as she spoke of the matters presented. Nine, she was absolutely unconscious of what was occurring about her. She neither saw, heard, felt, nor perceived in any way her immediate surroundings or happenings. 10. The close of the vision was indicated by a deep inhalation followed in about a minute by another, and very soon her natural breathing resumed. 11. Immediately after the vision, all seemed very dark to her. 12. Within a short time, she regained her natural strength and abilities. We see some of these above-mentioned points that she experienced, which were experienced by the Bible prophets as well. Would you like to know God's plan for our broken world as revealed in Bible prophecy? Want practical, trusted solutions for your biggest challenges? Encouraging and enlightening, Amazing Facts Bible Study Guides provide 27 Bible-based topical lessons with beautiful graphics and straightforward answers that are easy to understand. Each study guide leads you toward real, relevant Bible answers for the most important questions in your life. How can I have healthier relationships? When and how will Jesus come again? And so much more. Don't leave your future to chance. Transform your life with truths from the Amazing Facts Bible Study Guides. Available in English, Hindi, Tamil, and Telugu. Don't wait. Order your complete set of study guides today by visiting bookstore.aftv.in. Let's go to question number six. Are miracles definitive evidence of a true prophet? The Bible says, For they are the spirits of devils working miracles, which go forth unto the kings of the earth and to the whole world. Revelation 16, 14. No, miracles are not a proof that someone is a true prophet. They prove only one thing supernatural power. But supernatural power may come either from God or from Satan. That is why the Lord tells us, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. First John chapter 4 and verse 1. Remember the magicians of Egypt they did the same things what Moses did in front of Pharaoh. So the devil can counterfeit many things that God does when God permits. Paul wrote of the counterfeit miracles in 2 Thessalonians 2 and verse 9. He said, Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. Let's go to question number seven. What is the most important test of a prophet? The scripture says to the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. Isaiah 8.20 The law and the testimony was an Old Testament expression for the Bible. In other words, a message from someone who claims to have a prophetic utterance from God 
must be compared with the Holy Scriptures. We must test the prophet by the Bible and not the Bible by the prophet. Any true prophet of God will always agree 100% with Scripture. This is a true test. Joseph Smith claimed his information was superior to the Bible. He was an American religious leader and the founder of Mormonism and the Latter-day Saints movement. He brought his own Bible version where he incorporated prophecies in the Bible that talked about him. Many of the Mormons believed that his version of the Bible was true and were reading that book as the Word of God. Joseph Smith claimed that he had a visit from God the Father and his son Jesus Christ in 1820. Later he said that he received visits from an angel called Maroni, who Joseph Smith said was a resurrected being who died close to Smith's area in New York State about 1,400 years earlier. Most of what he thought were unbiblical teachings and also the prophecies that he said utterly failed. Ellen White, on the other hand, upheld the Bible and the Bible only before the people. She encouraged everyone to test those who claim to have supernatural gifts with the Holy Scriptures. She wrote in one of her classic book called The Great Controversy, the last great delusion is soon to open before us. Antichrist is to perform his marvelous works in our sight. So closely will the counterfeit resemble the true that it will be impossible to distinguish between them except by the Holy Scriptures. By their testimony, every statement and every miracle must be tested. The Great Controversy, page 594. Let's go to our next question. Question number eight. What is the second test of a prophet? The scripture says, Hereby know ye the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. 1 John 4, 2. A prophet of God must acknowledge and teach the truth about Jesus Christ, that he was God in human form. True prophets must also exalt Jesus and not themselves. You know, most false prophets, they seek to draw attention towards themselves and away from the word of God and to their own ideas. Ellen White always led people to look to Jesus, who she believed was fully God, God in flesh. She wrote, from the days of eternity, the Lord Jesus Christ was one with the Father. He was the image of God. The Desire of Ages, page 20. She also wrote that the life of Christ was his own life. She wrote, I quote, Jesus declared, I am the resurrection and the life. In, li in Christ is life original, unborrowed, and underived. He that hath the Son hath life. The divinity of Christ is the believer's assurance of eternal life. Unquote. The Desire of Ages, page 520. Her famous book, The Desire of Ages, is acknowledged by theologians across denominations as the best book ever written on the life of Jesus Christ, where she covers the four Gospels of Scripture like no other book do in the world. Let's go to question number nine. What is the third test of a prophet? The Bible says, Ye shall know them by their fruits, Matthew 7, 16. 
This does not mean that the Prophet will not have their weakness that they might exhibit now and then. We see Abraham, Jacob, David, Peter, John, all were mighty men of God. They faltered, some, they faltered sometimes in their lives. God's prophets have always had faults, but they repented and demonstrated in their lives that the Holy Spirit was working in them and through them. The Bible says, holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So they were holy men and holy women whom the Holy Spirit sanctified and used. There must be consistency between what the true prophets teach and their lives they live. But today, you have many people who claim to be prophets, whose personal lives are in a mess. Also, the fruit of their lips, their teachings, contradict the Word of God. The American Library of Congress has recognized Ellen White as the fourth most translated author in the world, the most translated female author in the world, and the most translated American author in the world. Remember, she was only third grade educated, yet she wrote topics covering so many fields which can only be verified today to be true. Several years ago, the Barna Group conducted a survey among the pastors of several denominations to find books and authors that have influenced them the most. The Barna Survey reveals books and authors that have influenced pastors. This was conducted in the year 2005. The under 40 pastors championed several authors who included business consultant James Collins, seminary professor uh, Tom Rayner, 19th century Seventh-day Adventist icon Ellen White, and Pastor John Ottberg. And Ellen White made the most impact among all of them. She is the most translated female writer in the history of literature and more translated American author of either gender. Her masterpiece, Steps to Christ, has been translated in over 140 languages. She wrote and published 5,000 periodical articles and 40 books, and now including the compilations from her 50,000 pages of manuscripts, there are over 100 titles. She wrote on all subjects because of her guidance and directions. The Seventh-day Adventist Church ventured into many areas to witness to the world. On education, 8,807 schools were established around the world. Adventists have one of the largest networks of school in the world because Ellen White guided the organization in this direction. On health, we have 211 hospitals and sanitariums that cater to the health of people. Ellen White pioneered the health institutions of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. She had many visions from God on the topic of health. She wrote, all our habits, tastes, and inclinations must be educated in harmony with the laws of life and health. By this means, we may secure the very best physical conditions and have mental clearness to discern between the evil and the good. Ellen White counsels on diet and food. On publishing, 60 publishing houses and branches that print literatures of truth. She pioneered the thought of having the publishing houses that would print books and articles of truth 
which would go to the whole world. She wrote, years ago, the Lord gave me special directions that buildings should be erected in various places in America, Europe, and other lands for the publishing publication of literature containing the light of present truth. From our books and papers, bright beams of light are to shine forth to enlighten the world in regard to present truth. Testimonies, Volume 8, page 87. What Ellen White wrote long ago on medical science is verified today to be true. Here are some of her statements that have been verified by medical science. Ellen White's words, the appetite for tobacco is self-destructive. It leads to a craving for something stronger. Fermented wines and liquors, all of which are intoxicating. Now, medical science speaks, children who use tobacco are more likely to go on to use in sequence alcohol, marijuana, and then other illegal drugs. Ellen White's words, Lately I have read of the death of many men. Their death is almost always attributed to failure of the heart. But in reality, the use of tobacco and liquor had poisoned the system of many of them. Medical science speaks, each year in America, as many as 300,000 cardiovascular disease deaths are the direct result of cigarette smoking. Ellen White's words, grains, fruits, nuts, and vegetables impart a vigor of intellect that is not afforded by a more complex and stimulating diet. Medical science speaks, meat contains a substance that impairs the brain activity and lacks a substance that the brain needs to function well. Dear friends, when the word of God says, believe in the Lord your God and you shall be established, Believe his prophets and you shall prosper. Second Chronicles 20 and 20. Yes, we need to believe that. God has sent a prophet to guide people back to the Bible to show the right interpretation of the word of God and to prepare a people for the second coming of Jesus. Many are now recognizing the value of the writings of Ellen White as being of tremendous importance and are being blessed tremendously. Paul Harvey, he said, he was the famous uh, American radio speaker. He said on national television, her writings have been translated into 148 languages, more than Marx or Tolstoy, or Shakespeare. Only now is the world coming to appreciate her recommended prescription for optimal spiritual and physical health. Ellen White, do you know her? Get to know her. I remember once I shared Ellen White's classic book, The Desire of Ages, to one of my friends. And I didn't tell him who Ellen White was. He wanted to know more about the Bible, so I just handed over The Desire of Ages by Ellen White. He read it and came back to me after three months. He read the 600 odd pages of that book, Desire of Ages. And he just had one question to ask me. He said, Michael, who is this lady who has written this book? And then I revealed to him the truth. I said she was a prophetess who had dreams and visions, and she saw all of this in dreams and visions, and she connected it beautifully with the Word of God. 
tears ran down his eyes and he said, I have never known her before, but after reading that book, I'm absolutely convinced she's a prophet and the Lord has spoken through her. Let's go to our question number 10. What is the fourth test of a prophet? The scripture says, when the word of the prophet shall come to pass, then shall the prophet be known that the Lord hath truly sent him. Jeremiah 28 verse 9. A true prophet will not make false predictions. If a prophet is of God, the things he or she says will come to pass. However, accuracy alone is not automatically a qualification for a person to be a true prophet. De uh, Deuteronomy 13, 1 to 3 warns that false prophets can also give signs that will come to pass, and they will use that influence to lead people away from the true God. A true prophet must lead people to worship God according to the Bible. Ellen White made many predictions and all of them have come to pass and some are happening even today. In 1902, Ellen White wrote, Not long hence, these cities will suffer under the judgments of God. San Francisco and Auckland are becoming as Sodom and Gomorrah, and the Lord will visit them in wrath. Life Sketches, page 412. On April 16, 1906, Ellen White wrote, During a vision of the night, I stood on an eminence from which I could see houses shaken like a reed in the wind. Buildings, great and small, were falling to the ground. Pleasure resorts, theaters, hotels, and the homes of wealthy were shaken and shattered. Many lives were blotted out of existence, and the air was filled with the shrieks of the injured and terrified. Testimonies, Volume 9, page 92. Just two days later, on April 18, 1906, a massive earthquake shook San Francisco and Oakland. More than 490 city blocks were destroyed. 800 people were killed. More than 1,500 were injured. And between 225,000 to 256,000 people were left homeless property was destroyed at the rate of one million dollars every 10 minutes by the fires which swept through the city following the earthquake. In another place, she wrote, on one occasion, when in New York City, I was in the night season called upon to behold a buildings rising story after story toward heaven. These buildings were warranted to be fireproof and they were erected to glorify their owners and builders. Last day events, page 113. Remember the 9-11 tragedy that struck New York City where the two twin towers, the World Trade Centers came crashing down? Ellen White continued, the scene that next passed before me was an alarm of fire. Men looked at the lofty and supposedly fireproof buildings and said, they are perfectly safe. But these buildings were consumed as if made of pitch. The fire engines could do nothing to stay the destruction. The firemen were unable to operate their engines. Well, when 9-11 took place, many newspapers had this prophecy of Ellen White and their fulfillment in their papers. Let's go to question number 11. What three things does Paul command regarding prophecy? 
he wrote, despise not prophesying, prove all things, hold fast that which is good. First Thessalonians 5, 20 and 21. Paul says that we are not to despise or to reject the gift of prophecy. Rather, we must test the prophet's message by the scripture and follow what is true and good. Question 12. Whose counsel do we reject whenever we reject the words of a true prophet? The scripture says, There is not a greater prophet than John the Baptist, and all the people that heard him, and the publicans justified God. Luke 7, 28 and 29. But the Pharisees and the lawyers rejected the counsel of God against themselves. Luke 7, 30. When we reject the words of a true prophet, we reject the counsel of God himself. Jesus said, O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. Luke 13, 34. God's true prophets have always been rejected by the majority, while the masses flock behind the false ones. Ellen White wrote, The very last deception of Satan will be to make of none effect the testimony of the Spirit of God. Where there is no vision, the people perish. Proverbs 29, 18. Satan will work ingeniously in different ways and through different agencies to unsettle the confidence in God's remnant people in the true testimony. Maranatha chapter 150. Yes, beloved, Satan tries his very best so that you and I will reject the true prophet and accept the false ones. But the Bible says, believe in the prophets and you will be established. Now, the reasons we need Ellen White's testimony. Number one, they uplift Jesus and you get a clear understanding of Jesus when you read her writings. Number two, to understand the great controversy, the battle between truth and error is clearly demonstrated in her writings. Number three, spiritual devotional blessings. When you read those spiritual writings, you are so blessed to understand the deep spiritual meaning of the Word of God. Number four, for physical and health advantages. She beautifully highlights in several of her books how our bodies are the temple of God and how we need to take care of it. Number five, uplift scriptures. She always points people back to the Bible and to Jesus, the center of the Bible. Number six, impact on church institutions. Because of her guidance and her writings, the church has been blessed and has done great things for the Lord. Number seven, the predictions. She has talked so many things about the future and guided God's people what to expect, rightly interpreting the Word of God. What's your response? Since God still speaks through prophets, and since a true prophet's word are the personal testimony of Jesus to you, are you willing to test modern prophets by the Bible and follow the counsel of those who agree with Scripture? Beloved, you have seen that God has sent a true prophet to guide and to lead us back to the Bible to understand the Scriptures better and to love Jesus fully. The Bible says, Prove all things and hold fast that which is good. Let's pray. Dear God, our Father, I thank you for the spirit of prophecy, for giving your people this wonderful gift 
so that we can understand the Word of God clearly and love Jesus more fully. I pray that we would always prove the prophets and hold fast that which is good, as your Word says, and be blessed. In Jesus' name, Amen. Have these presentations stirred up questions in your mind? We would be glad to answer any Bible question you may be having. Please feel free to call us at the phone number listed on the screen or you may email them to info at AFTV.in. May God bless you as you continue to study His Word. Can't get enough Amazing Facts Bible Study? You don't have to wait until next week to enjoy more truth-filled programming. Visit the Amazing Facts India Media Library at AFTV.in. At AFTV.in, you can enjoy video presentations in multiple languages as well as uplifting material to read, all free of charge, 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, right from your computer or mobile device. Visit AFTV.in today. For more than 50 years, Amazing Facts has been boldly sharing Bible truth around the world in response to Jesus' commission to preach His gospel to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. Thank you for your prayers and support.